Good morning, everyone. Uh, 7.45. Let's go. Uh, I'm Chris McNamara. I'm an associate with the uh, law firm Michael Best and Friedrich. Um, I'm based in our Milwaukee office. Uh, I work in the, the tax group. Um, a portion of my practice is, is devoted to clean energy tax credits. I also uh, spend some time uh, assisting uh, developers of large solar projects um, in navigating uh, the unique Wisconsin taxes and fees uh, they're subject to. Uh, and I'll let my, my colleague, Sean, introduce himself. Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Smestad. I'm a tax partner uh, in our Chicago office, um, tax generalist, but I also work a bit with Chris and uh, on tax credits. And uh, I'm not going to repeat what you just said, but yeah, so similar stuff. <laughs> uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, so Sean and I have a hopefully, hopefully a great presentation here for you today, which we've called Monetizing uh, Clean Energy Tax Credits. Uh, and it's going to focus on the, the new uh, transferability and, and direct pay provisions that the Inflation Reduc Reduction Act uh, added to the, the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, so, so as you all know, uh, the government uses the, the Internal Revenue Code uh, to try to induce certain activities. Uh, for example, you know, there's a, a deduction that's allowed for, for charitable contributions. And it also uses the Internal Revenue Code to try and dissuade or, or prevent other activities. Uh, for example, it doesn't, there, there's no deduction that's allowed for, for certain settlement payments uh, made in connection with uh, uh, sexual harassment or sexual abuse allegations. Um, so historically, uh, or at least as long as I've been practicing, uh, the Internal Revenue Code has always uh, tried to induce uh, the development of, of clean energy facilities. Uh, the, these clean energy facilities have historically been induced through the use of tax credits and certain deductions. Uh, two of the more well-known tax credits are, are the, the production tax credit and the investment tax credit. Uh, the production tax credit, which as many likely know, is, is based on uh, the energy that's produced and sold by a clean energy facility in a given year, while the investment tax credit is based on the, uh, the, the cost basis of, uh, of a clean energy facility when it's placed in service. Uh, credits are particularly valuable for taxpayers as they, unlike deductions, offset a tax liability dollar for dollar. Um, so for, for those with large tax liabilities, credits can be very valuable as they offer a way to reduce tax liability without having to actually pay cash. So, however, the, the production tax credit and the investment tax credit are, and I guess all clean energy credits in general, are, are non-refundable. Um, tax credits can be thought of to fall within kind of two buckets. There's refundable credits and non-refundable credits. Uh, refundable tax credits are, uh, I guess what, the, what they sound like, they're, they're, they're refundable, uh, meaning, you know, if the refundable tax credit exceeds your tax liability in a given year, uh, that, that excess refundable credit will, will be paid to you uh, as a payment. Uh, refundable tax credits include credits like the earned income tax credit and the uh, uh, portion of the child tax credit. Then there's the non-refundable tax credits, which include the, the, the investment tax credit and the production tax credit. Uh, non-refundable tax credits are non-refundable, meaning uh, they, they only offset tax liability uh, they only decrease tax liability to zero. They, they don't send it negative, sending, putting a taxpayer in, in a refund position. Um, and then, then the, the, the non-refundable uh, tax credit is then carried forward if it's not used in a given year uh, for use in a later year. So the, the non-refundable nature of, of clean energy tax credits you know, kind of presented a, a problem in certain cases. Uh, you need to owe taxes for these credits to be valuable. If you don't have any tax liability, the, these credits are kind of worthless, and the Internal Revenue Code's attempt to induce you to, uh, to construct a uh, clean energy facility or produce clean energy has, has failed um, due to the, the non-refundable nature of these credits. Ultimately, uh, you know, I guess in certain instances, tax structures were created to 
to try and get uh, these, these credits to, to flow to people who could use them, you know, from a clean energy producer or developer to someone who could use them. However, these structures were, were oftentimes uh, complex and, and you need to, to pay an attorney, uh, you know, m money to, to look at it and review the structure and make sure everything, you know, works. Uh, then to solve this, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, came along. Uh, as you all know, the Inflation Reduction Act was an enormous investment in uh, clean energy in the United States. It extended the life of various tax credits, added a bunch of new tax credits, uh, and then it also added uh, the, the transferability and direct pay provisions, which we'll be talking about today. Uh, these provisions allowed the, the tax credits to be easily monetized, uh, which was not you know, the case in the past. And by monetize, we mean turn this valuable uh, asset, this, this asset that offsets uh, tax liability dollar for dollar, easily into cash. So these two new provisions, transferability uh, and direct pay, have simplified the, the process uh, for uh, claiming clean energy tax credits and have democratized uh, clean energy tax credits uh, by allowing uh, a greater base of taxpayers to, to utilize uh, the credits. So today we'll be discussing uh, the, the topics I've listed here. Uh, I'm going to provide an overview of the transferability and direct pay provisions. Uh, then I'll discuss which credits are eligible for transferability and direct pay. Uh, then Sean uh, will provide a, a great deep dive on, on the transferability provision. And then I'll wrap up with uh, probably a, a quick overview uh, of the direct pay rules. Uh, so what is transferability? Well, transferability was a, a new, new section that's uh, added to the Internal Revenue Code, Section 6418. Uh, transferability allows essentially for-profit businesses uh, to, to sell tax credits that they generate, um, to sell certain, I guess, clean energy tax credits they generate. Uh, as an example, you know, say I was a small business owner. I installed uh, some solar panels uh, to help you know, hopefully reduce my small business's electric cost. Uh, these solar panels would likely be eligible for the investment tax credit. Uh, and say I generated a $100,000 investment tax credit. I, uh, my, my business has uh, a bunch of net operating losses that I've been carrying forward for years that have offset my, my uh, taxable income and reduced it to, because in this example, zero. Um, for, for a certain number of years and will continue to do so in the future. Thus, this investment tax credit that I've generated uh, doesn't have a lot of value to me in the near future because I'm gonna be using my, my net operating losses to continue to uh, offset my income. Um, this is where the transferability provision comes into play and allows me to, to get away to get cash for the credit I've generated um, and not need to wait until I have a tax liability where I can offset uh, the liability with, with these credits. Uh, so for example, uh, with my $100,000 of credits, I could find a, a buyer that would purchase the credits for say $90,000. Uh, thus I would receive $90,000 in cash for the credits, that's great. Uh, the buyer would receive $100,000 of credits, uh, which would offset uh, his or her tax liability and would have offset the tax liability while only paying $90,000 for the credits. Uh, so they kind of received $10,000 there. Uh, as a result of our transaction. Now, to turning to, uh, I guess that's the, you know, the transferability has kind of, this new transferability should change, you know, the cost benefit analysis uh, that goes into whether it's worth, you know, uh, constructing a, a clean energy uh, facility um, and maybe should tip the scale, you know, a little more in favor of the benefit uh, because it allows uh, for the easy, uh, for the credits to be monetized easily. So direct pay. Uh, direct pay is for uh, nonprofits and certain governmental entities. Uh, as I explained earlier, you know, to, to use these tax credits, you needed a tax liability. Uh, nonprofits and governmental entities aren't you know, subject to federal income taxes, so the tax credits were worthless to them. Uh, 
Direct pay changes that. It allows the, these uh, uh, nonprofits and governmental entities to essentially receive a refund uh, of the, the, the credit they, they generated. So it essentially changes the credit from non-refundable to refundable for them. Uh, and hopefully the idea is this will, will induce uh, nonprofits and municipalities uh, to you know, develop clean energy systems. Um, All right, so, so to, watch, uh, to watch tax credits to these new provisions apply, uh, I've kind of bucketed the, the credits up there. There's, I'll call production tax credits, which as I explained earlier, are based uh, upon the, the uh, amount of uh, energy uh, produced and sold by, by clean energy facility in a given year, and then investment tax credits, uh, which are based on the uh, the, the cost basis of uh, certain clean energy, uh, the cost basis of a clean energy facility placed in service in a given year. And then I have kind of the, the random uh, alternative fuel vehicle refueling property credit uh, down there at the bottom, uh, which I just kind of offset because it's in a, a different uh, part of the, the internal revenue code. Um, I guess some, I'll draw some common threads uh, with with these credits, these credits are all, all general business credits, uh, meaning that uh, while they all have their each, you know, their, their own unique calculations, you know, and their, their own intricacies, they're all ultimately collected on, on the same form on a tax return, it's called a Form 3800, uh, and reported there and kind of subject to the same rules when they uh, are placed then on, on when they reduce a, a taxpayer's income. Uh, for example, you know, general business credits can only reduce a, a taxpayer's income by uh, a large tax, uh, a taxpayer with a large tax liability of, of around 75%. Um, another common thread with these credits is that uh, all these credits are, are generated from activity that's performed in the United States. Um, and that makes sense because the Inflation Reduction Act, as well as these credits, uh, all sought to spur clean energy development uh, in the United States. And then finally, as a final note, I'll just point out the, the uh, investment tax credits. The one I see most in practice, um, it's the IRC 48. It's, it's a credit that's offered for placing into service certain quote unquote energy property in a year. The, the energy property includes you know, solar panels, uh, biogas property, uh, certain battery storage property, um, et cetera. Uh, so I'll just note that that credit uh, can be, be transferred because I, I see that one uh, in practice most often. Um, with that, I think, hand it over to you, Sean. Thanks, Chris. So uh, I'm going to speak a bit about transferability. Um, transferability is for taxpayers who are ineligible for direct pay, as Chris said. So uh, the, the uh, taxpayers that are, have the ability to get refunds of the tax credits uh, would not be able to use this, but they would instead use uh, the direct pay, which is a, a more beneficial program anyway. Um, there's no restriction on who can purchase the tax credits. This isn't exactly true. There is a restriction, one restriction. It can't be a related party to the seller, which makes sense for, for pretty obvious reasons. Um, only cash can be used to purchase the tax credits. So the tax credits can't be exchanged for, say, equity in the purchaser of the credits. Um, the cash for the credits is not includable in the seller's income and cannot be deducted by the purchaser. So the purchaser can't double dip effectively getting a tax deduction and then also getting the delta between the tax credit and what they've paid. Um, the purchasers can't resell the tax credits, which makes sense. I think the IRS and Congress don't want a regime whereby someone is effectively acting like the middleman, not really providing all that much value, buying tax credits and then selling them and taking a slice and uh, interestingly, and, and possibly, I think, the, one of the most uh, surprising, uh, given, given the guidance that was expected, uh, bullets on this slide, there's no requirement that all of the tax credit must be uh, transferred, which is to say 
the taxpayer who generates the credits can sell all a part or um, you know, most, however much they want to sell. They can also sell to multiple parties. So if somebody wants to buy a third of the tax credit and somebody else wants to buy two thirds, that's permissible as well. So pre-filing registration is required by the transfer uh, by the transferor. This is done via IR, uh, electronic portal on the IRS's website. Um, the uh, seller, the transferor, uh, has to go in, um, provide certain documentation related to construction or acquisition of eligible property, uh, provide certain validations, uh, such as the existence of the property and qualification for the credit, um, and then we'll obtain a registration number the registration number is used both by the transferor when they're making their uh, elective statement on their tax return, and then also by the transferee, and that can be one or several people to whom they transfer the credit. Uh, different projects will require different, uh, num different registration numbers. So the same transferor, if they have multiple projects, will have to register those projects multiple times, um, each project separately. Uh, the buyer and seller of the tax credit enter into a tax credit transfer agreement. Uh, the purchase price that we typically see is somewhere between 80 to 90 cents on the dollar, uh, usually somewhere in that range. Uh, the tax credits must be sold by the due date, including extensions of the seller's return for that given year. Um, and then correspondingly, the credit can be used by the transferee in the year ending with or after um, the, sell, the, the transferor's tax year. So say the transferor's tax year ends in March and the transferee's tax year ends in December, the transferee would use it in that same year. Um, if they end at the same time, then they have to use it in that same year. And then as I mentioned previously, the purchaser and seller file a transfer election statement, provides that registration number and both are required to, uh, both the transferor and transferee are required to provide that registration number and then the same transfer election statement on their tax return when it's due uh, for the first time so they can't go back and amend turns later. Uh, purchase credits are deemed to be generated from investment activity, from passive activity. And then there are also some risks associated with the transfer um, for the purchasers. Um, this is res uh, in respect of the project, not in respect of uh, recapture if, say, a seller sells a share of a partnership, which we'll get into on the next slide. Um, the excess credit transfer, is, as uh, we have written there, uh, is the excessive payment plus a 20% penalty, though that penalty can be abated if the transferee can show reasonable cause, um, or if uh, recapture applies, um, the, the, uh, for instance, if the project is not eligible for the credit. Um, if the seller has reason to know that the project might not be eligible or might be subject to the excess credit transfer rules. They are required to uh, provide notice to the purchaser within a reasonable time. What that means is not 100% clear. Um, risks can be mitigated through indemnification provisions, guarantees, the typical stuff we'd see in a contract. Also, some, uh, some accounting firms have speculated that we might see the uh, creation of an insurance product similar to reps and warranties insurance in the M&A space, uh, whereby uh, the transferor could see, uh, transferee rather, could seek an insurance uh, product to, to cover any, any potential loss, um, which I, I found pretty interesting. And then you know, due diligence should be performed as it should in respect of, uh, of any similar sale. Um, transferability for flow-through entities. Uh, flow-through entities typically allocate, can typically allocate the credits as they see fit to their partners, um, though the election itself is made at the entity level. Um, the, uh, the new proposed regulations actually allow partnerships or S-corps to determine whose share of the credits are eligible for transfer. Um, it's a new concept called partners eligible credit amount, which provides significant flexibility to partnerships and S-corps uh, who want to potentially transfer all or part of their credits. Um, flow through entities that sell credits are not immediately required to distribute the proceeds to the partners or, or shareholders. Um, and as I mentioned, recapture uh, occurs at the, uh, 
at the partner, um, occurs for the shareholder or partner, not for the transferee upon the sale of a partnership interest or, or share in S Corp. And um, flow through entities can also be purchasers. They, uh, they don't just have to be sellers, depending on the, uh, the flow through entity specific circumstances. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Chris, who's going to talk about direct pay. All right, I'll, I'll take us home here with direct pay. Uh, so as I previously you know, kind of introduced before, direct pay essentially makes the, these tax credits uh, from, from non-refundable to refundable for, for certain taxpayers. Those certain taxpayers are, are listed uh, up here on the slide. Um, notable to, to me among those is, is 501c3 orgs, or orgs that are uh, exempt from, from income tax. Um, So, so prior to the, the Inflation uh, Reduction Act, the, these clean energy tax credits, as mentioned, were kind of useless to these entities um, because they, they didn't have tax liabilities generally. Uh, however, the, the introduction of the direct pay, pay changes this by, by making uh, the, the clean energy credit that these entities uh, generate uh, refundable rather than non-refundable, uh, meaning that these entities will get, can get a cash payment, uh, essentially, uh, for, for the tax credit they generate uh, by the government. So the, the procedure for direct pay is, uh, is pretty similar to, to transferability. There's also pre-filing registration that's required. Uh, uh, the IRS, I think, is currently suggesting this be completed uh, 120 days before uh, a tax return is filed. Um, the idea behind the pre-filing registration is, is being done to prevent fraud, um, I guess by giving the IRS kind of a sneak peek on, on what your project is to, to ensure you know, it's uh, eligible for, for the credits. Um, to, to claim the, the, the credit as refundable, uh, after you do your pre-filing registration, you get a registration number. Then to claim the credit as refundable, you do so on your tax return. Uh, so for, for nonprofits, uh, they do so on, I think, their Form 990, or they might have to file a Form 990-T, which is used to, to report uh, unrelated business income tax, or, or UBIT. Um, and it's reported there and claimed as a refund uh, on that form. Uh, so, so the due date for making the election uh, to treat the credit amount as a uh, direct pay refund is the due date of the, the tax return. Uh, the IRS has stated they're not going to provide in, in the proposed in the regulations they proposed related to this new provision that they're not going to provide any relief for, for a late election. If you meant to treat the, the credit amount as a refund but you failed to do so on your originally filed return, uh, you're kind of out of luck. Um, so for, for entities that don't file a tax return like a municipality, uh, uh, how would they go about claiming the credit? The IRS is actually making them, it seems, uh, file a uh, tax return to claim the credit. They have to file a Form 990-T, which again is, is the form used to, nonprofits usually use to report UBIT, and on that form they'll, uh, they'll report the, the credit amount as, as a refund. Um, so what, what would be the due date for a free municipality for, for filing its tax return? Uh, the IRS has said you should look at the annual accounting period for the municipality, and then the due date for filing the return to claim the refund will be uh, the 15th day of the fourth month following the end of that annual accounting period. So for example, you have a calendar year, your due date for filing your tax return is April 15th. Uh, the IRS has also stated they'll, they'll offer uh, municipalities or entities that don't typically file tax returns an extension. Uh, of time to, um, to file the tax return. However, it's not really clear yet how you go about requesting uh, that extension of time. And then finally, I'll mention uh, there's some special rules with production tax credits. Uh, production tax credits are kind of generated over a number of years, you know, as, as the energy is produced. Uh, for example, you know, you're able to claim the IRC 45 production tax credit for 10 years after you place the, the qualified energy property into service. Um, and that the production tax credit then varies in a given year depending on how much energy is uh, produced and sold by the facility. Uh, when you make a, uh, 
a direct pay election with the production tax credit, um, the uh, election uh, makes the credit refundable for just five years, uh, not the entire 10-year period. So during those five years, you'll, you'll continue to get uh, refunds, but then you're required to, to remake the election uh, after those five years to continue to treat uh, the uh, production tax credit that's being generated as refundable. The IRS does also allow, you know, if you, if you change your mind or, or your nonprofit, you know, ends up being subject to UBIT and that the credits would be useful uh, there, you, you can change your mind and revoke the uh, election to treat the credit as refundable. Um, and then finally, I'll conclude with, uh, with risks, uh, which I guess I've titled risks, but maybe there should be just be more concerns or considerations when uh, electing to, uh, to treat a, a credit amount as, as a refund. Um, there's the excess of payment, what Sean mentioned. Uh, and then there's also uh, <coughs> Uh, recapture, what Sean also mentioned, and I'll just elaborate a little more on. Um, recapture is kind of an investment tax credit concept. Uh, it applies when uh, you dispose of or stop using energy property uh, within five years of it being placed in service. Uh, if this occurs, that then a quote-unquote recapture of the tax credit occurs uh, where you're required to uh, to kind of pay back a portion of the tax credit uh, if you dispose of it or cease using it as energy property within that five-year period. Uh, the amount you're required to pay back varies uh, depending on uh, how long into that five-year period you are. It uh, decreases 20% each year. So for example, uh, I claim an ITC, uh, refund it uh, on my tax return. Um, if I dispose of that property within uh, before two years of placing it in service, um, there's an 80% recapture, so I would have to, on the tax year in which the recapture occurs, uh, file return showing my recapture amount and then ultimately paying that amount back. Um, so with that, I think we have uh, concluded our, our presentation here on, on monetizing uh, clean energy tax credits. I see we have three minutes left, so if, if anyone has any questions, uh, we'd be happy to, uh, to give a go at, uh, at answering them. <laughs> a church that doesn't um, provide a 990, how do they um, apply for that? Oh, so, so then you, the, the church does have to file a 990 in, in that instance. Uh, they file a 990T for that year. I'm, I'm kind of interested to see how that actually works because you don't really have, uh, I don't know if, yeah, I, it just, I'm interested to see how that works just because it'll just be a one-year return. Uh, I don't really know how it's going to play out, but you are required to file a return for the year during what you claim the credit to, cl to claim the refund amount. don't know the answer to. I don't know whether you know, Sean. I, I think the regulation, sorry, I think the regulations just uh, speak to partnerships and S-Corps. Um, but, oh, uh, yeah, I, I think it would apply then in that case. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you, Sean. Uh, sure. I just had a direct pay question. I'm a developer and I talk to municipalities and utilities a lot, and I have the sense that with direct pay, there's still a very high level of uncertainty or concern about how it's actually going to work out. So I guess my basic question is understanding that the policy is this way, how is it really working out? Are, are they receiving direct pay payments at this point, or is it still too early? Is there still uncertainty with the IRS, or is it a pretty set program? I, I have not yet walked uh, worked through the entire direct pay process myself. Um, I do think, I think for, for those entities that, that file a, a tax return, it seems like it should be a pretty straightforward process. As long as, I think right now you want to be on the, the pre-filing registration, which we mentioned, uh, that's kind of the important thing, in, in my opinion, to, to tee up kind of immediately, is, is just get that pre-filing registration done so you give yourself the opportunity uh, to, to claim the direct pay amount should you choose to do so. Do you want to talk about cost basis for nonprofits? 
Uh, yeah, it, it's my understanding that cost base. It, it, I, we we spoke a little bit before before our presentation. It's my understanding that cost basis include would include the amount of grants. And I, I think you mentioned that that's that's the guidance you've gotten from from other firms and accounting firms as well. Yeah, uh, that that's that's our understanding. I, th I believe, and Chris, correct me if you disagree, it's, it's in the year that it's, it's purchased. Yeah, I think they can then carry it forward. I don't know that they can carry it backwards, uh, but they can carry it forward thereafter. So, so the IRS is saying uh, pre-filing should be done 120 days before you file your tax return. Uh, so, so a lot of these credits maybe were generated from activity in, in calendar year 2023. If you have a calendar year tax return, uh, it would be due without extensions, uh, we'll say, uh, either March 15 or April 15, depending on your entity type. Um, but you can extend that, that due date. So uh, the pre-filing registration should be kind of completed ASAP. Uh, so you have that registration number and, and you're set to go at the time you file your tax return, which again, you can extend. Uh, so, and, and to be clear, while Chris spoke about that in the direct pay, that goes for transferability as well. On a multi-year project, is the tax credit only when the composite is completely completed and commissioned, or can there be multiple tax filings for costs incurred during the year of a multi-year project? Um, I, I think that the it's supposed to be when the project is put in service. Um, are, are you saying like a portion of the project would be put in service over the course of, of several years? No, no. Yeah, it, it, it's supposed to be completed the year you're placed in service. Sorry, I know you've been raising your hand for a while. I have two questions. Are there clear definitions for what is meant by placed in service by the IRS? Uh, Chris, I think that's covered in the regulations, right? Yeah, I, I think it would probably, it, I'm sure there is somewhere. I don't know if it offhand. It would yeah, be, because it, it's used for like depreciation as well. So, uh, there are clear, uh, there is a clear definition somewhere. I, I don't know of it offhand, but uh, it's a concept that's used elsewhere in the code, so. Uh, yeah. And then, my other question is, in your experience as attorneys, I mean, have you been asked uh, for legal opinions that this, what we think will happen will actually happen? Is this a thing in the industry yet, particular tax credit? Uh, I, I think we've seen it. The credit's pretty new, so we, we haven't had a ton of these come in, but we, we've worked on opinions in respect of these. Uh, Chris, you have as well, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess I've done uh, opinions related to these. Uh, want one, and then we have another one that's uh, possible, I guess. So, yeah. And you're providing an opinion to the transferer or the transferee, or both? I guess uh, I should say I, I don't anticipate that that opinions will be needed normally. You know, in, in the regular process of, of of buying and selling these credits, I don't think. Uh, I think the, the way the, the rules work out, it's straightforward enough where, where an opinion isn't necessary. Uh, I, I guess the opinions I've provided are in wonky fact situations, uh, which uh, hopefully none of you all uh, will run into. That's good news. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, you're saying like if, if it's being, if they're also getting a grant from another party or uh, the, that, that sort of situation? Yeah, the, the project is, uh, is funded through bond Oh, the project's funded through bond funding. Yeah. yeah I, I think that'd still be eligible for, for the credit. Even the bond funded portion. I, would it, you're just talking about like a, ta like a tax-free municipal bond type of situation. I, I believe the answer to that's yes. Okay. Chris, that, that's your understanding. Too, yeah, right? I, I don't know the answer to that offhand. Uh, I'd be interested, I guess, to learn that because there is uh, a reduction in the credit for tax exempt uh, financing in other yes, uh, areas, but, but not with direct pay. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Mm 
Mm. No. Yeah, I don't think so. Yep. Uh, only the tax owner should be able to depreciate the uh, the, the property. Okay. Could you just, um, just really quickly go through the pre-filing um, registration process, how you started with that? Yeah, so I don't know, Sean, if you were, uh, yep. sorry to. Sure, so it, it's on the IRS's website, um, it, you, you, Log in. Um, you'll you'll get a trans a, a number as as you uh, register, and then you'll have to use that number jointly with uh, whoever buys the credit. So everyone will have to have the same number. But but it, it's an it's an electronic portal on the IRS's website. Yeah. Yeah. It's so so you you uh, I guess you submit certain information related to the projects. Not I don't think the information is too detailed, is it? No, they they want uh, information about. Um, about the project itself, uh, the proof that it, it's uh, owned by who it's owned by, uh, the proof that mm -hmm. it's been placed in service or constructed mm -hmm. or acquired, uh, th things like that. Yeah. And then so you submit in there, and then you wait a while to get your registration yeah. number back. So do you have to pre-register after it's been placed in service? I, I, it doesn't have to. Uh, that's that's actually a good question. I'm not sure of the answer to that one because it would, you know, what if what if it's placed in service in December, but 120 days is, is before that. I'm, I'm not certain of that. 